And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Josh Burson to the stage. All right, thank you all for coming in after lunch and hanging around to listen to Learning in the Flow of Work. Um, so what I'm going to talk about for the next 45 minutes or so is essentially a paradigm shift that's happening in the learning and development industry. And, you know, I sort of tested this idea over maybe six or seven months ago, and it seems to be resonating. And so, um, so I'm going to take you through a bit, bit of a story for the next 45 minutes. And at the end of this, I think you're going to come away with some very different ideas on how to think about the L&D space, your solutions, your strategy, your technologies, and of course all the great things you can do with LinkedIn. So a little bit of, to get started about where we are in the economy and why this is such a relevant topic. First of all, you've seen these kinds of charts before. We're in a very, very low unemployment environment. It's getting, the job market's getting hotter. It hasn't slowed down at all. Um, I was at a conference in Eastern Europe a week or so ago, and basically what people said is, we can't hire anybody. It's impossible. The only way we're going to hire somebody is to take them away from somebody else, and as soon as we raise our wages, they raise their wages. So, um, and I heard that in Japan. I've heard this all over the world. So we, so we have this issue of, of talent. We have this issue of skills, and CEOs now have come to the realization that it is the number one issue on their minds. Uh, this is the CEO research from Conference Board. They put this out every year. Last year, it was cyber terrorism, global warming, immigration. This year, it's skills, talent, capabilities, diversity, and measuring the performance of our people. So this has now reached you know, sort of the senior levels of business leadership. And one of the reasons for this, of course, is all you heard the, the data this morning from Jeff about all of the changes in the workforce, um, jobs being automated and, and changing so rapidly, skills changing. But it's more than that. It isn't just need for more AI and the need for more technical skills. I mean, the technical part of the market is, a, is an important part of the market, but it's really this. It's that the digital business models that companies have, have found themselves trying to transform them into require a different type of business, different people to do different things. Um, if you look at the US stock market capitalization over the last few years, we're becoming more and more of a service economy. And one of the indications of this is the valuation of almost 80 to 90% of the US stock market is what is called intangible assets. An intangible asset, if you go to business school, means we don't really know what it is. It's, it's IP, software, brand, services. It's not oil in the ground. It's not raw materials. It's not cash. It's, it's the things that we do as people. So skills and capabilities are the, are the business that you're in, regardless of the company that you're, that you're part of, regardless of the industry. And so skilling and continuous education is really a life or death issue. Um, now at the same time all that's going on and we have the, the acceleration and demand for skills and the changing skills, we're also changing the way we work. Um, this is research we did at Deloitte two or three years ago and it continues to evolve that more and more companies are realizing is that the hierarchical job models, the hierarchical way we pay people, the job descriptions, the levels, the way managers move up, the, doesn't really apply to the way businesses operate today. We work in teams, cross-functional teams are really the secret to success um, in digital businesses. And when you operate like the picture on the right, which most of your companies do that, even though you may not be formal about it, um, skills become the currency of a team. So when you're spinning up a team to solve a customer problem or design a new product or come up with a new marketing campaign or fix some internal issue, then who do you want on the team? You want the best people on the team. So if you don't either have access to the right skills or know the skills of those people, you, you don't know how to staff that team. So skills have become an internal form of currency on getting ahead in the business Today, it isn't just how long you've worked here, how many people you know, how connected you are to the leadership. The currency of success is now skills, too. So that's driven this. And to make it even you know, more important, we have this elongation of the, of the talent cycle. Interesting data on this is that of all of the things that have happened in the world of work, we actually are getting healthier. Now, yeah, we're under more stress. We're getting less sleep. We have all these other issues. 
But the average um, baby born in 2018 in a given date lives six to nine months longer than a baby born a year earlier. So, so, the lo so, so all of this medical research and pharmaceutical work that's been going on the last decade or two really has made the world healthier. And what that means for you and for us is that we've basically got employees now from the ages of 23, 24 to the ages of 60, 70, and soon in their 80s, all working in our companies, five generations, maybe 60-year careers. Um, and so um, part of the learning challenge is how do we not only reskill and continually skill people in the early stages of the career career, but what about the people at the higher levels of the, the older stages of their career, bringing them back into the workforce? We had an interesting conversation with the head of learning at General Motors who's kicking around here um, yesterday and he talked about this program called the Take Two program where GM is basically going out to alumni, people who have retired or left GM and maybe haven't been working for maybe five or 10 years and saying, we want you back, we'll train you, we'll skill you, we'll pay you. We may not pay you as much as we did when you were working here full time, but we want you back and they're getting tremendous um, demand for that. And so that's another part of this whole issue of skilling. Now you've seen the data from LinkedIn this morning, you saw it from Jeff. I mean, the thing that I'll highlight here, and it was interesting that he brought up the same thing I've been saying, which is soft skills are in demand just as much as hard skills. Um, yes, we need software engineers. Yes, we need machine learning people. Yes, we need data scientists. But that's a relatively small percentage of the total workforce. It's about five or six percent of the overall workforce. The other 94 percent of us are using tools and we're working in teams and we're, and we're trying to figure out how to work better in organizations. And um, a study was done recently by Bloomberg and Workday um, where they interviewed about 300 senior HR execs and asked them amongst the college grads that you're hiring, how well are they ready for work? And basically the answer was, you know, they're pretty good at the technical stuff. They understand math and they understand science. A lot of them have built software and somewhere in their earlier in their educational lives but they don't know how to do complex problem solving, they don't know how to work in an organization, they don't understand being part of a team, um, they're not necessarily good at persuading or, or convincing. That, that interesting chart that Jeff showed this morning that had oral communication, did you notice that the most in-demand skill in the United States is called oral communication? That's kind of a funny one. I mean, that's a strange way of saying all these soft skills are really in demand. So, so there's just as much appetite for communications and persuasion and, and team skills as there is for technical skills. Um, and you know, added to all that is the fact that the career model that was built in the days when I got out of college, I mean, the, you know, the whole world you know, was built in the 19, really around the 1930s and 1940s. We created this model of retirement at the age of 65. And that's what the social security system was all built around. And so there was this idea that you were gonna to go to school for 25 years, you were gonna work for about 30, 35 years, and then you were gonna retire. And now we're living longer, careers are changing, and everything is, is going in a different direction. And if you look at this data, it's really astounding how quickly companies have realized that that vertical up or out career model that we developed, you know, certainly in the 1970s when I started working, really just doesn't work anymore. And so that creates more demand for continuous development and continuous learning in the workforce. Okay, now um, the other part of this I wanna to touch on before I get into the idea of learning the flow of work is what's going on for your employees. Most of you know this, and you're all very enlightened L&D professionals, but I, I see it in my own children. Um, right now, most um, business professionals, certainly early in their career, will basically say that other than salary, which is still very important, especially now, um, my ability to stay current and develop myself is the biggest reason I'm taking this job. And it's the biggest reason I will leave this job. Um, so if you're not developing and implementing a, some form of continuous learning experience in your company, you can bet your employees are concerned about it and the good ones are gonna leave. And so the, this is now not just an economics sort of formula, this, is, this has really reached the stage of employment brand. Um, and yet despite that, people don't seem to have enough time. And the interesting thing that I've found you know, in my you know, journey through this you know, market over the last 20 years is right now we're in this very strange period 
where the economy's growing, we're all becoming digital businesses, but we're actually getting less work done. And if you look at productivity, this is US productivity, and you can see it's flattened off since the 2008 recession. Productivity in Germany is, is practically flat. Productivity in Japan is negative, productivity growth. This is all the developing economies are suffering from this. And the reason for it, there's a lot of economists trying to figure out why, but I think the main reason is that we haven't rewired our work experience and our businesses around the world of digital yet, and we're still operating in old work styles with new tools. And the symptom of that is people are just overwhelmed. Um, now, you've seen these kinds of charts before. We, we first wrote the chapter on this in Deloitte, uh, I think it was 2016, but we just did a survey with LinkedIn just a couple of weeks ago, and we surveyed about 2,500 people, and we asked them, you know, what are the things that are keeping you from being productive at work? And 27% of the respondents, and these were professionals of you know, sort of various different ages in several different countries, 27% of them said, almost 20% of my time is wasted on email traffic that is not relevant to my job. Now that doesn't surprise me. I don't know what your guys' emails are like, but I feel like that's all I do all day is run back to my computer and delete half the stuff in there and try to figure out what's relevant. And it's affecting us in many, many ways. And, and it's nobody's fault. I mean, this is just a problem of where we are with the, the world of work and where we are t with technology. And what it means is when you tell somebody it's time to do learning, they're trying to time slice it into all this other stuff going on. Now, we did a study at Deloitte on about a year or so ago and we found out that the average employee at that point in time told us they had about 24 minutes a week to learn, which is sort of a strange low number. Um, let, let, we just did another survey with you guys with LinkedIn, and we found that the average, that there's actually different categories. There's people that spend no time learning, there's people that spend a little bit of time learning, and there's people that really spend a lot of time learning. And the interesting thing about this research that just came out is the people that spend a lot of time learning are getting a huge benefit out of it. Somehow they have reduced the clutter or they're ignoring the noise in their workspace and they're spending time going to LinkedIn Learning or somewhere else, taking courses, learning what they need to learn. And look at, look at the data. They're less stressed, they're happier, they believe they're performing better, they're improving their uh, potential career growth. All those are good things. So we've got to figure out a way to give people more time and reduce the clutter in the work experience so that they can learn in the world of all of these other stresses for, redevelop for, for, um, for continuous development. So how do we do that? That's really what brought me to this point. Now I've been doing this, you know, you guys know me. I mean, I actually don't come from l and I've been an analyst for almost 18 years. But I realized the only way we're really going to fix this is we're going to have to figure out a way to take all these wonderful learning assets we have, whatever the form of content is that you're you know, most enamored with, and allow, it to, allow people to access it in the flow of work. And so that's what this is all about. And it has been hard. Um, I would say that the L&D function went through a dark period the last few years. Now it's come out of that, but we did some research in 2015, 2016, that showed that the average L&D department at that point in time had a very significant negative net promoter score. And the reason for that was that the learning management systems industry had fallen behind. We didn't have all these learning experience platforms yet. Uh, we didn't have some of the new tools that LinkedIn's launched yet. And frankly, you know, people were just pulling their hair out not knowing what to do. Employees were going out and buying lynda.com on their own nickel and then just bypassing the corporate training department to find what they needed to learn. Um, and, and so we put more money into the learning and development profession, the learning and development profession. In fact, this is an interesting chart. I don't know if you guys know this, that of all the different areas of HR that have been invested in the last year, and by the way, the HR profession, and it went up by almost 10% this year. That's a lot, that's a huge amount. Average spending on HR went about 10%. The two areas that are growing the fastest are learning and recruiting, and learning actually grew faster than recruiting. So this is a big investment area. And, and where we are is we're in this transition period. Now, if you go back, take, you know, just let me spend one minute on this chart. 
Um, I've always found that the L&D profession is one of the most avid consumers of new technology. When I worked at IBM in the 1980s, I was, I was actually at IBM when the PC was launched. And I remember when the first PC showed up in the office, the first they were, first they were black and white, and then a color one showed up. And the color one had a big CD-ROM player on it. You guys remember what those things were like. And somebody had built some training on it. And it was absolutely fascinating. Everybody wanted to buy it for training. And this has happened to every technology evolution since. When YouTube came out, it became a training platform. When Twitter came out, it became another form of a learning platform. Every piece of technology eventually, very quickly, gets absolved into learning. And that's what's been going on here. And as we do that, we have to rethink all of the paradigms of learning. The paradigm of e-learning in the early, decade, early 2000s was instructor-led training in a window, basically. For those of you that have been around as long as I have, that's what it was. It was instructor-led training with some little bit of interactivity put onto a browser. And we then realized, well, maybe we could use video. So we started doing some video. We had Flash, so we couldn't do video very well, so then we had to get rid of Flash and wait till HTML grew up to video. Then we started to do search. Uh, you know, meanwhile, by the way, the LMS architectures were all developed sort of 10 or 15 years ago in this sort of course catalog paradigm. And so all of these technologies are coming fast. Now we've got AI, we've got cognitive, we've got voice recognition, we've got um, you know, real-time location-specific information in the workforce. L&D is trying to catch up with all this stuff to build tools and solutions to take advantage of it. So we're in this sort of weird state where we, we know that all these tools are available, but the L&D marketplace and the L&D solutions, the L&D platforms haven't really caught up. And that's the reason that this, this is really so much of a paradigm shift as much as, much as it is just you know, brand new tools. So what, am I, so what do we do here? So, so what does this idea mean, learning in the flow of work? So I've been thinking about this and talking to all the vendors and looking at all these wonderful solutions that companies are doing. And let me give you a, sort of a way to think about it. The first is this idea of micro-learning. Now, when I worked at Digital Think long ago, and we had all these you know, very, very sophisticated instructional designers, I remember having a, and I was in charge of product management, and, and we had a bunch of customers that said to us, will you just give us PowerPoint online with audio? And the instructional designers said, absolutely not. We're not doing that. It's not valid instructional design. Nobody will learn from that. Well, we're past that now. Right? Everybody accepts that, yes, a short video is fine. The stuff on YouTube is learning. Uh, so, so we now have this world of accepting the fact that everything that we write down, every article, every podcast, every little video, whatever it came from, can be used in the form of learning. But you're not going to develop a whole new skill set with that. You're not going to change your career with that. You're not going to get promoted because of you know, a little piece of micro-learning. It's going to be more of a performance support type of experience. On the other side of that, we still have the need for formally developed, high fidelity, structured learning too. Because sometimes, you really need to change your entire way of thinking about a problem, and that will then change your career and your role. And the both of those have to coexist. So you might ask yourself sort of how much of one versus the other. Should we, should we do all micro-learning? Should we do all you know, long-form learning? How does it fit? Well, it turns out um, there's a way to think about this. And one way to think about it is to think about this chart. And this is a you know, sort of hypothetical picture of what it's like to go to any job. When you start a new job, you're new, and you go up a steep learning curve. And you, you know, maybe that's a year that you're on that learning curve. Maybe it's nine months. And you reach a point where you get it. And you're sort of you know, good at the job. And you kind of come down the learning curve. You say, oh, I'm not really learning very much anymore. And at some point, you say, oh, great. I got a new assignment. Um, my boss gave me a new project. I got a new client. Um, I got a raise and a promotion. Now I have a bigger sphere of responsibility. You go back up the learning curve. And that's a good thing. Or if you work for a company that isn't managing you well and doesn't have that kind of a learning environment, you go down, the, you, you have this, where you're kind of bored and fed up and you're tired of doing the same thing, and maybe you leave. And I remember doing a really interesting case study with a, call, a very successful company, uh, financial services company, where all the employees start in the call centers. And they determined that little point, that little vertex, 
was 18 months after you started in the call center. And they learned that if they waited 19 months before they gave you an assignment, the retention rate plummeted. People would leave. And so they designed their entire learning experience around this curve so that somewhere around 12 months into the job, you started to get new materials and access to new training and new career development tools to move you to the next level of that growth. And, and the way this really works is that at some point in your role, you will need macro learning, onboarding, job transition, promotion, move to a new role. And then while you're in the job, you're going to need micro learning. And that's why people use things like LinkedIn learning, because they can get access to whatever they need while they're in the job. And both of these go together. And at some point, you're going to get credentialized for your skills, and then you're going to want to teach other, your, other people your skills. So this sort of picture is one way that I would recommend you think about the learning experience in your company. Because we just had a meeting this morning with a bunch of L&D leaders, and the number thing, one thing on everybody's mind was, how do we build a learning experience that people can use? They can find what they need and, and consume the learning that's appropriate to them. And I, I'm not a fan, by the way, of just giving people a giant portal and letting them do whatever they want. I mean, that's nice, and that might be a great tool that really engages people, but it may not move the needle. It may not improve the sales productivity. It may not improve safety. It may not improve leadership unless you have some structure around it. Now, you know, once I started thinking about this, I went out and I looked for some data. Oh, here's, here's another way to think about it. I thought, I guess these slides are a little bit sort of, I lost a few of my builds here. But, but basically, in the flow of work, you go between not knowing enough to knowing too much to not knowing enough to knowing too much. And this is what happens to your employees every day. There's periods of time where somebody says something in a meeting. This happens to me all the time. And I don't know what they said. I just don't know what that thing is. And I run back as soon as I get out of that meeting and I look it up because I don't want to be stupid next time I go to that meeting. Um, or you're in a meeting and it's just utterly boring because you've been through this before. And this is what we're trying to do is keep people in that sense of flow where they're constantly challenged yet also capable of, of moving up the, the learning curve in whatever role it may be. Now, um, you know, as I was sort of testing this idea, I, I, I ran across the folks at Safari. Now, Safari is a, is a book company, basically, that does technical education. And they are very, very successful and very well known in the tech industry. And they've started to add micro and, and, and learning assets to their library. And they did some research uh, for me. And we talked a lot about this. And they looked at about 200 and some odd thousand um, uh, users of their platform. And they found that it was almost a perfect model that when people were new to a topic, first of all, they found that about 60% of the consumption was micro, about four, or, or it was macro learning or structured programs. About 42% was you know, these small little snippets of information and books and articles. Um, and they found it was almost a perfect model that the people that were new to a domain, new to a technology, new to a tool of some area of technology that they were supporting were going through the structured learning first very significantly, and that you could watch them wean themselves off it as they grew and become much more of an unstructured learner as they became better. And so they basically learned that the way to think about this is sometimes you're going to have people in your company that are going to need structured, scaffolded, high fidelity learning to transition from role to role, job to job, and sometimes the high performers are just going to want to get what they need and move on. And so it's a simple model, but I think it's a good way to think about how to rationalize what to do. You know, one of the things that, you know, that we developed a long, long time ago, uh, when I was doing L&D research, you know, maybe a decade ago, was a model for this where we basically said if you built it, and I don't have a slide on this, but I'll just give you a sense of it. If you built a two by two, and the vertical is, is this strategic or operational? And the horizontal is, is this um, off the shelf or custom to us? And you look in the upper right, where you have highly strategic activities and skills that are custom to you, that you can't buy off the shelf. There's only a couple things in that quadrant. You have lots of stuff in the lower left and lots of stuff in the other areas. But those are the kinds of things where you have to build these you know, highly structured, um, very high fidelity programs. At Deloitte, there's a giant you know, investment in new 
in consultant training. It's very hands-on. It's face-to-face. -face. It's scenario-based. It's done in a group. Um, but there's also lots and lots of ad hoc micro learning as well. So, so you're, one of your biggest challenges is to figure out when to do the macro learning and then fit the micro learning into the rest of the flow of work. Now, you know, in terms of micro learning, there's been a lot of education, a lot of learning about this. Uh, one of the things that's now you know, fairly well known is this, this whole research on the forgetting curve. And I'll just touch on this. This is research that was originally done in medical education where they were trying to teach people anatomy and just tons and tons of rote learning. And they found that you know, more and more and more consumption didn't create retention. But if they revisited the topic repeatedly, it stuck. And it has to do with the way your brain wires new information. And you can see these curves flatten out. So one of the uh, tricks in micro learning is not just creating people, giving people a giant library of stuff, but actually using some form of adaptive learning to refresh and remind people of the material that you want, that you believe they need to know. So a good example of this is safety training. One of the applications of micro learning that I found was really interesting is a company that's using an adaptive learning platform for people in a manufacturing distribution environment. When they go into work in the morning, they clock in, they get a little window, they get a one minute video, or maybe it's two minutes, it's very, very quick, with some safety tips. And, you know, they get, you know, a couple, couple of things every morning, and they revisit them on a very, you know, repeated strategy with, a, with some very interesting algorithms behind it, behind it. And they found that in this particular example, rather than sitting people down for two hours and teaching them all the safety things they need to know about how to drive a forklift and how to lift things and so forth, they got a 30 or 40 percent reduction in accident rates as a result of using these approaches with very small amounts of time in the flow of work as opposed to the traditional way of thinking about learning. So this has a big impact. Now the other thing that I want to remind you of, and those of you that are L&D professionals probably know this, is that repetition is not enough. As you can see, this is from the same research at Purdue, is that repetition re increased retention from 28 to 46 percent, uh, giving people a concept and, you know, sort of a theory, uh, sort of increases, increases uh, retention to 41 percent, but getting them to use the material or practice it allows them to increase their retention even more. So think about that. How can you get people in whatever learning environment you're working to use the material you've given them in some form of practice. And today there are tools, and I would hope that LinkedIn builds one of these eventually too, where you can actually go online and share the information you've learned with your peers in a collaborative environment and get graded and feedback from your peers. And those kinds of tools can be done virtually as well. So remember that you always did homework in school and you came into class and the teacher asked you to present your homework to your peers. It's all about using the material you have. So those are all things that are really becoming part of this. Now gamification is part of this also. It's interesting, we had a long conversation about that this morning with the learning leaders that are here. Um, it turns out that people actually like games. Games are very engaging. Accumulating points on your frequent flyer, I, I, it always cracks me up. My daughter wants to pay for my airline tickets so she can get the miles on her account. And she wants to, I was, at, I was at a coffee shop with her the other day, and usually I pay for her coffee. She says, hey, Dad, let me pay for it. I want to get the points. You know, and so she spent the $20 on coffee instead of me. Um, this stuff actually pays off. So this is another trick that is becoming uh, well understood in some of these learning platforms, giving people micro-credentials, points, um, feedback, leaderboards. I mean, these things sound a little bit silly, but they really, really have a big impact on people's um, you know, enjoyment of the learning experience. Now, while we're talking about micro and macro learning and technology and adaptive learning tools and all that great stuff, let me remind you that that's not really the whole story. Um, if you really look at you know, very successful learning organizations, they don't just do that. They also have places where people can learn. In fact, it's interesting, the last couple of years I was at Deloitte, one of the biggest requests that we would get from clients is help us build a corporate university, a physical corporate university. Because we've got all these people working online and collaborating, and we need a place for them to come together and work on a project and meet 
and talk about things and facilitate conversations. So this continues to be important and it's probably more important now than ever because we are so virtual and we spend so much time online that getting together continues to be important. And then the fourth is what we would call experiential learning. Learning on the job from your boss, from your peers, from the other people in your organization, having a learning culture, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now let me just give you sort of an interesting comment on that. Uh, one of the people I had a chance to meet a year or two ago is Edgar Schein, who's a very, very famous uh, professor who wrote many, many books on corporate culture. And he's very famous for you know, teaching companies about corporate culture. And I was talking to him and I asked him, you know, of all the things you've learned about culture in all these years, is there any one thing that's the most important of all? And he said, yeah, it's really only one thing. It's people helping each other. Do you have a company where people are willing to help each other? And I thought, you know what, that's actually kind of a profound idea. Because I've worked in companies where they do, and I've worked in companies where they don't. And, and this number four here, this experiential learning, is how well and how willing and how much of a reward system do you have for people taking time to help other people do their jobs. In fact, we just, I was just in a meeting with one of the heads of L&D from Dow Chemical explaining how they do that, how that's one of, part of the culture of Dow, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons Dow Chemical's been around so long. So that's gotta be important too. So let me just remind you that learning in the flow of work is not just a bunch of tech stuff, it's also human and culture as well. Now, we've studied this um, in the Burson business. We've done at least four times, maybe five times, we've done these massive studies of L&D. And what we find when we look at maturity, and these, these bars are different levels of maturity, is that the companies that are the most successful in training and developing learning and delivering learning in a meaningful way do a lot of things. They have very heterogeneous um, learning strategies, so they accommodate all these different types of programs. So I just want to remind you that it isn't all about the technology, it isn't only about the content. We, in the most recent um, maturity model we developed, and the way we do these maturity models is we survey seven or eight hundred companies and we assess all sorts of practices that they're doing in different practices of HR, and then we go back and statistically correlate them to see what practices seem to be in place adjacent other practices, and when then we build these maturity models, we found, it was interesting, before we even came, I even came up with this concept of learning in the flow of work, that flow and thinking about learning as something that happens all the time in the company, continuously in the flow of work, actually is the most sophisticated way to think about L&D. Um, so, and it's a relatively small number of companies that are doing that today, but I think it's gonna become more and more. Now, how do we get there from here? What's really happening? Well, first of all, we've got a lot of facilitators that are making this possible that were not possible before. The first is um, technology standards. The XAPI, which some people are a fan of, some people aren't, um, is actually in some ways kind of a breakthrough. Because when all we had to track learning was SCORM, we couldn't track these small interactions with the learning system. We didn't have any, we didn't have any data about it. Now we know, your, your talent platforms know, um, you know when somebody's reading an article, how much time they spent on something, um, what type of asset they're, they're looking at. And so there's a category of tools now that's allowing you to really diagnose what parts of your learning experience are being used and what parts are not. Second, people are shifting in, the, in their usage. Um, the, the data shows more and more and more today, about 25 or 30 percent of the learning investments in the United States and around the world is in the formal mode. Now that formal number is not gonna go away, but more and more of the online that used to be formal is now online, is virtual online, or it's supported by apprenticeship or uh, team-based learning in the flow in, in the job. And by the way, one of the things I've learned about L&D, if you're in a corporate L&D function, is if you don't keep up with the learning in the flow of work, the business people will do it anyway. They're gonna do it without you. Somebody in the sales department's gonna do training. Somebody in the customer service department's gonna do training. They're gonna figure out some way to do it without your help. So if you don't get with it and be part of this, uh, you just become sort of a sideline to them. So to some degree, this is a little bit of a survival um, strategy for, for corporate L&D. Um, if you look at research, this is Don Taylor's research last year on what are the hot topics people are interested in. You can sort of see 
that adaptive delivery, personalization, um, collaborative social learning, these are the hot topics right now. You know, listen, I've always been a big fan of MOOCs, but the MOOC model didn't really work super well in the corporate learning industry because we don't have time to go through long courses like we do in a university. Yes, they're useful in some cases, but that didn't turn out to be the paradigm changing um, you know, tool for corporate, but some of these other things are. We also know that the L&D capabilities have changed, and most of you probably feel this, but it's something to think seriously about. Um, in the days, you know, 10 years ago, instructional design, the, uh, the Addy model, uh, Kirkpatrick, uh, you know, Jack Phillips, ROI, those were all the things we learned about. I mean, that was where all the books were written on that stuff, blended learning, you know, all of those concepts. Now it's about personalization, experience design, design thinking, more data-driven learning experiences, understanding multiple forms of content and multimedia and building better micro-learning experiences, learning experience platforms. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we now have in the L&D industry didn't even exist two or three years ago. And so now we've got sort of a, we're sort of like kids in a candy shop with all of these possible ways to make learning in the flow of work. As far as the learning architecture, it's still pretty tough. We really did think for a long time that the LMS was the center of the learning experience, and that's not true anymore. Um, and I was a part of that. I mean, I worked with a lot of LMS companies. Um, today, I would say the LMS has become more like the mainframe in the basement. It's there, it's doing its job, it's running a lot of business critical business rules, and it's, maybe it's handling customer education and e-commerce and compliance, and maybe you're doing a little bit of talent-driven learning. But most companies are finding out that the user experience of the LMS is not able to keep up with this learning and flow of work. Now, I'm not saying the jury's out on the LMS market. The LMS vendors are very scrappy software companies. They're going to build better front ends as fast as they can. But most companies now have 22 different learning tools. I mean, this just blew my mind. Um, it's getting more complicated, not simpler. And I think one of the things you, you really need to do to be successful, we were talking about this this morning, is you need to have somebody in your company who is like an architect, who looks at the tools that are out there and comes up with some sort of a rational um, sort of tool set of what, you, what you're going to standardize and what you're not going to. It's, it's, you, know, you go to these technology shows now and you look at all the tools for learning, um, curation tools like Filtered, which allows you to find learning and recommend learning through chatbots. Virtual reality tools like Striver that can virtually put you in a real world situation. The learning experience platforms, the new assessment tools. I mean, there's a lot of technology out there. And the LMS, unfortunately, is not the center of all that. Now, I built this particular chart uh, maybe nine months ago. It's probably slowly becoming out of date. But you can see there really are starting to become new categories in the market. The one that's the sexiest right now is the learning experience platforms, LXPs. Uh, these are really, in some ways, uh, learning-centric portals that allow you to curate and publish content um, of any type from any source. Um, to some degree, the, learning, um, the, the LinkedIn learning platform is probably becoming a learning experience platform. We've been discussing that with the, with the LinkedIn folks. Um, there are platforms that are more oriented towards structured program delivery, and then there are platforms that are really oriented toward micro-learning delivery to deliver this time-based, sequence-based, repetitive uh, learning. Then there's obviously AR and VR tools. I actually think virtual reality is going to be a much, much bigger play in the learning industry than you might imagine. If you haven't played around with VR learning, you really ought to look at it. If you're in a manufacturing environment or any high risk or safety oriented um, situation, even Walmart uses this now to train retail employees on what it's going to be like when the store gets crowded. It can actually simulate a real world situation in an incredibly high fidelity way. Obviously the content business, these adaptive learning workflow tools like WalkMe uh, that actually allow you to develop uh, real-time learning experiences on, on, on applications, and then, of course, the learning platforms. Now, the cool thing about this is I think LinkedIn is playing a lot of these spaces. Um, the LinkedIn learning team are pretty smart people. They know what's going on in this space, 
And I think their roadmap involves significant amounts of enhancements in almost all of these areas. So if you're doing business with LinkedIn, I think you're going to be in really good shape. But there is a lot of noise, and there are a lot of vendors in the market. Um, I think this is going to become another dimension to this. Um, most of the learning platforms today are cognizant of the metadata in learning, but they don't understand the content yet. Um, LinkedIn went through and indexed all the content in Linda. That all, that's, that all information is now available. I understand there's plans in LinkedIn to use all that metadata and that data to give you better search into learning. Why, not, why wouldn't you just chat with the learning system and have the learning system answer the questions for you? That's what this product Magpie does from this company in the UK called Filtered. And there's other tools that are starting to do that. There's actually a company by the name of Volley in San Francisco that built a system, an adaptive AI-based learning system that reads documentation, identifies the actual learning needs and the, and the sort of skills and competencies within the documentation, and then creates um, sort of micro-learning activities that you could query like this automatically from your, from your sort of your product or operational documentation. So this will be an important part of the learning industry. But I think the other thing that comes along with this learning and the flow of work is you're going to have to do some pilots of your own. I remember, I mean, I, I talk to companies about this all the time. This is a time for experimentation. One of the banks that, that I studied or really did some interviews with last year went through a process of trying to figure out how to improve the onboarding and first year training of their retail employees. They have very high turnover rate, as many banks do, something like 60% turnover rate. And they did a project where they basically went in using design thinking and they studied the experience of these employees in this bank in the flow of work. You know, what's the first week like? What's the first month like? What do we need them to do the second month, the third month? And they built a series of learning interventions. Eventually, they built an app that did this to take care of all the issues that these people have at different stages of this first year of this job. And they had a dramatic reduction in turnover and a huge increase in employee uh, engagement as a result of doing that. That was a pilot that they started with that turned out to be highly successful. So you have to do that. And you also have to get ready for the fact that many of the learning platforms today are going to be part of another system. And this is something where obviously LinkedIn has a huge leg up because of the relationship LinkedIn has with Microsoft and other you know, major providers. But if you go back to the very beginning of the presentation where I talked about why people are so busy at work, dealing with their emails, dealing with whatever it is that's coming your way, um, why wouldn't the learning experience be embedded in that? If you're doing a, perf let's suppose you buy Glint, for example, and you use the uh, survey tool in Glint, and you get a survey back that says that your team is, you know, unhappy about your ability to run meetings on time. Why wouldn't the system just give you a link right there to a course on how to run better meetings? I mean, why wouldn't um, any of your, why wouldn't your Salesforce system automatically surface for you tools on how to better manage opportunities? That's where the world is going. More and more of these learning tools now are being opened up to manifest themselves in the systems of productivity that your employees are using every day. And that's where I think this will be a year from now. We come back to this conference, you're going to see learning truly being in the flow of work. Let me just summarize with one point, because I'm out of time. All of this stuff is exciting. It's interesting. There's all sorts of new tools and technology. But I still believe at the bottom of it all, you still have to focus on culture. People have to feel that they're given time that, that the time they spend on skill development will be rewarded, that they will get credit for the skills they've developed and they'll have an opportunity to move back up that learning curve, um, that their managers will respect and understand the time they're spending on learning, that there will be after action reviews and discussions of mistakes. Those are cultural things. And I think one of the most maybe important and noble things that we do in HR and per particularly in L&D is foster and develop this learning culture. So that continues to be really the foundation of this. So that's kind of the story. I think learning in the flow of work is a really important paradigm, and I hope this gives you at least a few new ideas on how to take advantage of all these wonderful tools we have to build a great solution for your organization. Thank you for inviting me to come speak this afternoon. <clears throat>